Welcome to Springfield Meadows, 25 new build homes of the future available now. Generously positioned over an almost eight acre plot, this is a very special development of carbon neutral, net zero energy homes for a life with low utility bills. Springfield Meadows sits in the village of Southmore, just 12 minutes from Abingdon's riverside pubs, shops and leisure facilities. Iconic Oxford is only 11 miles away with its 117 trains per day into London. Many eco-developers fail to consider the environmental impacts of building houses. Sassy Property is proud to achieve net zero carbon in construction. Skillfully crafted from natural materials with solar panels and air source heat pumps, these homes are good for both the planet and your quality of life. Yeah, we think this is the greenest development in the country because we've combined a few things that haven't been done together before. We've got zero carbon footprint for the construction. We've got net zero energy in use. We've got bioregionals, one planet living certification. And we also got what we think is the first partnership with the Local Wildlife Trust to advise us on the uh, nature and wildlife and ecology on the site. And you put all of those things together and we think it's the first time it's all been done. Our philosophy here is to produce a great place to live, to set an example of how future developments can be done. So we want to have a zero carbon footprint, so that's zero embodied carbon. We want to be net zero energy in use, and then we also want to be friendly towards wildlife and ecology, but we also want to link to local transport, food networks, and things like that. So we've used the One Planet Living as an overall framework for this, and that's a 10 point plan. One Planet Living is a very simple concept. It was developed by a charity called Bioregional about 20 years ago. And it's simply the concept that we've got one planet and one planet of resources. And some of those resources are finite and some of them are renewable, but they only renew or regenerate themselves at a certain speed. So if we're using the resources faster than the planet can regenerate them, we're going to run out of them. It's a bit like spending the capital in the bank rather than living off the interest of it. So at the moment in Western Europe, we are consuming resources about three times faster than we should be. So we need three planets to sustain our lifestyle. Uh, North America, they're, they're consuming resources five, six, seven times uh, faster than the planet can renew them. So if we're going to live within the resources of one planet and uh, we're all going to live happy, healthy lives and it's going to be equitable and fair, then we've got to reduce our consumption in the West to allow the third world to come out of poverty and start to live better lives. As part of the One Planet framework, we look at a number of different factors. We look at everything from energy and carbon to water and waste, health and happiness, ecology, transport, and there are 10 different items on the list. Within each of those items, we produce an action plan that says how we're going to minimize our use to get it within our fair share of the Earth's resources. Sometimes that's relatively easy, so we can get embodied carbon down because that's our speciality. Things like transport can be very difficult if you live in the wrong place. We're very lucky here that this development at Springfield Meadows is right on a bus route which takes people into Oxford and Swindon and Whitney and Abingdon. But if we were miles from a bus route, it would be very much more difficult to get the transport right. So some things are linked to location and some things are linked to what you can do. But in all cases, we can do positive things to, to reduce our impact on the environment. And that's really a one planet living action plan. This is our second project that we've done under the One Planet Living Framework. The first one we did at Longcott was 15 houses and it achieved One Planet Living national leadership status and we were absolutely delighted with that. This one is 25 houses and we've achieved One Planet Living global leadership status and we're one of a very small number of projects worldwide that have achieved global leadership status so we're really proud of all of the 
activities and materials and transport and processing of all those materials are responsible for CO2 emissions. That's the embodied carbon that goes into the production of a house. And normally when you build a house, it's about 50 to 60 tonnes for a standard house. What we do here is use bio-based materials, so things like timber, hemp, wood fibre, and all of those, because they're bio-based, they've absorbed carbon dioxide during their growth. So the plant has turned carbon dioxide into cellulose through photosynthesis. That means it's got carbon locked up in it. So you've got some things like the bio-based materials that have got carbon locked up, and then you've got things like concrete, steel and glass that have emitted CO2 when they've been produced. If you balance all of those things together, we can achieve a zero carbon footprint. So that's embodied carbon. But we also, because we get the, the CO2 in use down by making the buildings very efficient, we can also get to net zero energy in use as well. What we've done is calculated the amount of energy each of these houses will use. So that's heating, hot water, and lighting, all of those regulated use these, that are controlled under building regulations, and then unregulated things like typical use for washing machines, cooking, gaming, computers, all of those sorts of things. And we've calculated what each house will use each year, and then we've made sure there are enough photovoltaic panels on the roof to generate at least that amount of energy each year. So under normal circumstances, each of these houses will generate as much energy each year as they use, and that's net zero energy. It means that across the year there's a balance. In the summer we'll be generating more energy than we use, and in the winter we'll be using more than we generate, but it balances across the year. My background, actually I did a degree in physics at university, but during the holidays I worked on building sites and I thought building was far more interesting and fun than physics so instead of becoming a physicist I became a builder and that was back in the 1980s and I found myself working on buildings that were pre-1900 so they were generally built with solid walls they were different to modern buildings they didn't have damp proof courses they used local materials generally that were not transported very far they were low energy natural materials things like earth plasters and lime plasters and initially when I started working on these buildings everybody told me it wasn't possible to get these materials anymore you couldn't use them you weren't allowed to use them all sorts of rubbish like that and over a period of time I began to realize that you could get these materials you could make them yourself and after about 10 or 15 years of working on historic buildings it just seemed to me that they were inherently sustainable because they were local natural low energy materials and I started asking myself questions and asking questions to other people saying why aren't we still using these materials things like lime mortars and lime plasters and it was because there wasn't really the knowledge and those people who had the knowledge weren't taken seriously in the mainstream construction industry so in the early 2000s I set up a company called Lime Technology and we started promoting lime mortars for new buildings and we won some fantastic projects like the rebuilding of St Pancras Station. And as we started to get more and more on top of lime mortars, uh, I came across lime and hemp. Um, there was an architect in Suffolk called Ralph Carpenter who was doing some good work and I was inspired by what he was doing and I thought I wonder if we could do some of that and I became hooked and for the last 15 years I've been trying to gradually refine the way we use lime and hemp and we now do it in an off-site manufactured panel system that we make in a factory because the big problem with lime and hemp is the speed of drying and we now do that in a factory before it comes to site. So it's been a full circle of historic buildings leading on to eco buildings and uh, I've then become aware of car carbon footprints, passive house, and all of those sorts of things. It's been a, a really interesting learning curve for, for many years. I've been involved with building hemp buildings for about 15 years now, and we use it because it's got certain qualities that no other materials have. So when you mix hemp together with a lime-based binder, you produce this material called hempcrete, and it's got um, negative carbon footprint, it's a good insulator, 
but it's got what's called thermal inertia. So it's, it's like a pseudo thermal mass. It behaves as a heavyweight structure, even though it's lightweight. So that means when our external temperatures fluctuate up during the day and down during the night, the internal temperature stays pretty constant. And uh, by having a layer of hempcrete in our buildings here, we get all the benefits of that, as well as combining it with wood fibre insulation to give us extra insulation so that we get passive house levels of performance. The passive house standard is a, a German standard that was uh, developed in the early 1990s by Professor Wolfgang Feist. He was a German physicist and he quite rightly established the fact that buildings obey the laws of physics and if you work out what's going on you can actually design better buildings. So. The passive house standard means that you have to have all the opaque elements, that's things like floors, roofs, walls, with a U-value of 0.15 or better. And then you've got to have triple glazed windows and you've got to have an air tightness of 0.6 air changes per hour or below. And you've also got to have mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. And you design the houses and model it all in a spreadsheet and providing you come out with a figure that says it's going to use less than 10 watts per square meter as a peak heat requirement or less than 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year as an annual heating demand or cooling demand for that matter then that achieves the passive house performance and although it's primarily an energy standard it's all about comfort as well because if you hit get all of those things right you produce a house that's really comfortable to live in it has no drafts you don't get condensation on the inside of the windows, you've always got fresh air coming in through the ventilation system. So it becomes a really comfortable, healthy place to live, as well as a very energy efficient house. There are quite a few myths about passive house. So one of the th things is people think you're not allowed to open the windows. That's absolutely untrue. You can open windows if you want to. Uh, if you open windows in the middle of winter when it's freezing cold, of course you're going to lose heat and get cold air coming in. Um, but that's your choice. Um, the fact that you've got a ventilation system that's always bringing fresh air in means that uh, you haven't got to open the windows if you don't want to because you've got the fresh air coming in and the fresh air comes through filters which means if you're one of these people who suffers from allergies, hay fever, asthma, that sort of thing, you've always got very good levels of air quality. So again, it, it makes for very comfortable, healthy living. This is our wall panel system, it's called BEYOND, that's B-I-O-N-D, and it's our own, our own building system we, that we've developed over the last seven or eight years. When I first, first started working with Hemcrete, we used to do solid cast in situ walls, typically 300 millimetres thick. Um, and it's a lovely way of building houses. You put up shuttering around the timber frame and you cast them on a thick wall. One of the things that we found was in trying to scale it up and do more and more houses that it was very weather dependent. It dries very slowly. Hemp is the most amazing material when it's dry but it can be quite challenging to get dry in bad weather. So about 10 years ago we made a series of panels for a project for Marks and Spencers and we were happened to be building about 85 houses on site at the same time with cast walls and we realised that those that we made in the factory didn't have any problems with drying. Those that we cast on site went through a particularly challenging winter and it delayed the process of building because they were slow to dry. So for the last 10 years we've been doing everything as panels made in the factory and we've refined this and we've also done it in such a way that it can be scaled up for the mainstream construction industry. So we have plasterboard and conventional gypsum plaster on the inside, which is not shown here on this model. Um, then we have battens, which create a 25 millimeter service void. So that's where we put all our pipes and wires and services. Then we have a breathable air tightness membrane. So this is a bit like Gore-Tex. It will let water pa pass through as vapor, but it's waterproof to water in liquid form. And it also won't let air pass through as well. So it sounds like a bit of a contradiction. It's breathable but airtight. 
but it's a bit like wearing a Gore-Tex jacket when you're outside doing activity, the perspiration goes right through. Conversely, if you're wearing a plastic waterproof jacket, you sweat and get horrible. So this is like Gore-Tex. And then we have a, a perforated racking board here, which allows us to dry the hempcrete by blowing air through the holes. We have a, a double stud timber frame. So from here to here, a structural stud on the inside and a stud on the outside that takes our external finishes. We have 120 millimeters of hempcrete, that's lime mixed together with hemp, um, together with uh, a secret binder that we put in there as well. And then we also have 180 millimeters of wood fiber insulation. And the, the hempcrete is a good insulator, but not as good as the wood fiber. But this has phenomenal thermal inertia, it's also fireproof. So the combination of these two things together give us all the thermal inertia, fireproofing, insulation we need. And then on the outside of the panel, we have a blue membrane, which is also vapor permeable. And it's a lot more vapor permeable, about 10 times more vapor permeable than the inside membrane. So any moisture that's in the wall goes out rather than in. So we create a, a, a gradient for water to move out rather than in. And then outside these, this blue membrane, you can finish the, the panels with a variety of different finishes. So timber cladding, render. Uh, this one here shows 60 millimeters of wood fiber board and we render directly onto that. That improves the U value and also the carbon footprint. But you can use timber cladding, zinc cladding. Um, you could even have brick or brick slips, stone, all sorts of things. The hempcrete is absolutely fireproof. If you were to hold a blowtorch to this hempcrete, you couldn't ignite it. Um, and when we do a, a fire test here, we put this panel against a furnace at 1100 degrees centigrade for an hour, and the temperature at the back of the hempcrete here never gets above 78 degrees centigrade. Last year, we started to realize that that we're probably coming at this from the wrong point of view. Instead of trying to minimize the negative impact on the environment, why aren't we trying to create a positive impact on the environment? And so we've now developed what we call climate positive housing, which is houses that lock up more carbon than they emit, they generate more energy than they use, they massively increase wildlife and biodiversity on the development, and they act as a catalyst for local green transport networks, food production, and that sort of thing as well. So we want to do 500 climate positive houses over the next five years. One of the challenges we have to overcome is the fact that most of the building land is either owned or controlled by the big PLC house builders. So we need to find land that's not controlled by those people and is owned by people who share our sort of vision. They want to do something different. They want to leave a legacy. They want to see sustainable development and we're building up a network of landowners that we know that we can work with to help them get planning permission and develop projects that are climate positive and really act as a catalyst for change. So we're always looking out for landowners who've got land for projects, anything from 25 to 250 houses that really want to do something positive.